Robert Land with you. No full show this week because I'm on a much needed vacation, but I hope you guys enjoy this extended conversation with the Emeritus of Houston Sports Reporting. I'm talking about Mickey Herskowitz, the Houston Post and Chronicle sports editor and reporter for over 50 years. He started covering Houston sports in the early 1950s and didn't retire from the newspaper business until 2006. We're going to talk about baseball's beginnings in Houston. So I want you guys to hear a little bit of this song I found about the death of the Colt 45s when they became the Astros. This is great stuff. Gather round, partners, I'll tell you the tale of the long-ago team of the big western sky. Name for the firearm that saddle broke Texas. Come hear the tale. Team born to die, the team born to die. I know it may sound queer, but the Colt 45, they existed three years. The team born to die. How about that? That's a gem that you won't find anywhere else. Well, before we get started, just a quick word from our sponsor. Houston Sports Talk is brought to you by the Goff Financial Group. The Goff Financial Group is an independent, fee-only investment advisor serving Houstonians for over 20 years. Not sure how your investments are performing or simply need a second opinion? Call the Goff Financial Group at 713-850-8900 for a complimentary portfolio review. That's 713-850-8900. The Goff Financial Group, your source for objective financial advice online at GoffFinancial.com. That's G-O-F-F Financial.com. Before we dive into the old Houston Buffs or Colt 45s or even Rockets and Oilers with Mickey Herskowitz, he told me about where his love of baseball began. I discovered baseball, Robert, when I was eight years old. I was such a little baseball freak, as a lot of kids were in that time frame, that I had no other interest. And one night, my dad stopped me walking out the door of our apartment, and I was in my sleep. I was actually sleepwalking. He asked me where I was going, and I said, I'm going to the drugstore to get the baseball scores. And in those days, you could go into certain restaurants and certain pharmacies, and they actually kept a wire ticker that gave you inning by inning results of baseball scores. And so literally, I was so obsessed with baseball that I would think about it at night in my sleep. And on this one occasion, I was actually, I don't know how far I would have gotten if he hadn't stopped me, but I was going out the door to the drugstore, which was about four blocks away from my apartment, to get the baseball scores. I remember what happened. I was in a barber shop getting a haircut, and I opened a magazine. I was just an obsessive reader as early as I could remember. I picked up a magazine, and I read a story about two Detroit Tiger pitchers, Hal Newhauser and Dizzy Trout. Uh, Newhauser's in the Hall of Fame, later worked for the Houston Astros. But anyway, I read that, got my haircut, and uh, about a year later, discovered the sports section. Would check the box scores every day and found out that Newhauser and Trout were real people, that they actually existed. And so from that time on, the Detroit Tigers were my my favorite ball club. Even when I started covering the Astros, I was still rooting for the Detroit Tigers. One of the great thrills of my life was covering the 1968 World Series between Detroit and and the Cardinals, Uh, Bob Gibson and Denny McLean and Mickey Lolich. Of course, one of the great top 20 World Series of all time. You started when you were 14 for the Houston Post, although we're not supposed to say that because nobody was supposed to know you were too <laughs> well, young to work, huh? Actually, I, I started writing for the Post when I was 14, as I like to say, kind of tongue-in-cheek. They started paying me when I was 19. I actually covered junior high school football. What happened was I was going to Johnston Junior High School, and I was writing sports for the our school paper, and a writer for the Post, who later also was a writer for the Chronicle, Dan Cook, who found a home and a legend in San Antonio, saw me taking notes on the game and got me to cover the ball game for the Post while he went over to the Cougar Den across the street at the University of Houston campus so he could hustle the co-eds. And when he heard the, the, the gun that went off that signified the game was over, he'd walk back over across the street from the campus get my notes and, and take them into the paper. And after a while, he quit using my notes. He'd just take whatever I wrote and put that in the paper. So 
I actually wrote junior high school sports for about three years for the Post. At 17, I went to the Marines. When I came out, I was 19, and I was hired by Clark Deal to write for the Post. Clark had been the sports editor of the Houston Press. It was an old Texas Aggie. When Clark offered me the job, he asked me to come out to his house. He had me meet him in his backyard. He was poaching about an acre of land that somebody owned behind his house. And like a good Aggie, he was growing his own vegetables. I remember he had carrots and turnips and onions and things like that. So he was on his knees wearing Bermuda shorts and digging up with a spade some of his vegetables. And I remember we chatted for a few minutes. And the first question Clark asked me was, what's the least amount of money you could work for? And kind of a funny question, but one that kind of gets to the heart of the matter. And I had been discharged from Marines. I was a 19-year-old buck sergeant making $98 a month. I did the calculation in my head. I was living at home. I had a car. The only expense I had was gasoline for my car. So I said to Clark, forty-two fifty a week. And he said, you got it. So that's how I went to work for the Post, and that was the starting salary. I want to ask you, because you, you were here from the beginning. There was no Astros. There were no Rockets. There were no Oilers. The Houston Buffs, I guess, were the game in town at that time. Rice Owls football, I assume, at that time was really big. This was in the 1950s. The first time you go to a Buffs game, what's the atmosphere there? We don't hear a whole lot about the Buffs. We, people forget that the, the minor league team was a big deal. Dizzy Dean played for the Buffs. Joe uh, Medrick, Ducky Medrick was uh, on the Buffs. Uh, Tris Speaker. Tris Speaker. They had, I think, like eight Hall of Famers came through the Buffs system. Kenny Boyer was with the uh, Vinegar Ben Mizell played for the Buffs. The atmosphere was just like it was when the, Buff, when the Cold 45s and Astros came to town. It was a big league atmosphere. They had sellouts most of the time. The general manager and later the owner of the team was Alan Russell, who was a great showman, one of the great promoters of all time. When they would have a big sellout crowd, when they'd have a game with a uh, another contender, Dallas or Fort Worth, were usually the teams they were headbutting with. Alan would literally rope off part of the outfield and have people buy those seats, standing room seats in the outfield. And they would be standing behind the, the outfielders. And uh, the outfielders had about, I guess, between home plate and where the rope was, it was probably like 295 feet. And then the next 30 or 40 feet was the uh, fans. It was colorful. The fans were just pumped every night. The players were great. They'd take hours to sign autographs. People like Solly Hemus and later Jerry Whitty and Larry Miggins, they lived in Houston. They came to Houston, fell in love with the city, and made it their home. Solly Hemus is still living here today in his 90s when he retired after a career as a player and later a manager of the Cardinals, he went into the oil business and made a fortune. Terrific success story, and one of the really, maybe the name is unfamiliar to a lot of fans, but Solly was the longest living legend among any Houston sports figure. If Earl Campbell and Hakeem Olajuwon, Nolan Ryan, if they live another 40 years, they will have been as, had a heroes in Houston as long as Solly. <laughs> Well, let me ask you about the Colt 45s getting started. And one of the things that I was checking out the other day is really interesting. And people, I think Astros fans, Colt 45 fans might not remember this, but they tried to steal another team at first before they got the Colt 45s. And also, and I want you to tell this story, they even tried to start another league. They were getting other cities involved to start another league. That's how they were trying to get their foot in the door in the major leagues, right? Yeah. Actually, going back to the middle 50s, Glenn McCarthy at one time made an effort to get a, a well, actually, McCarthy's effort was, was mostly directed at pro football, but he got interested in with a group of people that wanted a baseball team. But there were different Houston people who, who at one time or another made approaches to try to acquire the Chicago Cubs, the St. Louis Cardinals, the St. Louis Browns, and the Philadelphia Athletics. And they were never successful. All of those teams used whatever interest was there to try to get a better deal for the city on their stadium rental or their stadium upgrades. It, it became so frustrating because Houston, for a number of years, outdrew teams like the Browns and the Philadelphia A's every year. They they were actually outdrawing major league teams. And they had a ballpark, Buff Stadium, 
that was undersized, but it could have been expanded. But it was certainly every bit as clean and, and crisp and bright, had air-conditioned women's restrooms when very few major league teams did. Houston was ready to have a big league franchise going back to the 40s. They knew that to attract a team, there were two eight-league teams, 16 major league cities was all there was, nothing west of the Mississippi, and nothing on west of St. Louis. They came up with the idea that really was a, a kind of a hoax, but they were going to start a third major league. The American Football League had gotten started about the, the, the talk had started in the late 50s, and the American Football League came into existence in the 1960. The leading baseball group in Houston was headed by Judge Roy Hoffines, a former mayor and county commissioner, Craig Cullinan, who was the son of one of the founders of the Standard Oil Company, and George Kirksey, who had been the sports editor of United Press and uh, a magazine writer for magazines like Collier's and Look and Saturday Evening Post. And that kind of really dates us because I don't know if any of those magazines are even still in existence. But Kirksey was the, the lightning rod, and he was the boots on the ground. And Craig put up some of the money, and Judge Hoffines brought in R.E. Bob Smith, the largest landowner and the biggest, most successful oil man in the state. And Bob Smith put up whatever money that was needed. So they got an idea. Lamar Hunt had been involved in starting the American Football League. Lamar was also going to be part of the baseball campaign. They had Bob Housem in Denver and I forget, Bob Short in Minneapolis. They actually had six to eight teams. To make it look legitimate, they actually hired Branch Rickey. And, of course, Branch Rickey is known through all kinds of legends and lore for signing Jackie Robinson and breaking the color line as general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Ricky was also the general manager of the St. Louis Cardinals for many years. Ricky came in as a consultant with the idea that he would be the commissioner of the new league. By then, he was getting up in years. I, I don't know if I could even guess within a few years how old he was, but he was probably pushing 80. But he still had that gift of, of, of language. He still had that Churchillian eloquence. It could make a hell of a speech. But nevertheless, his value to these people that were trying to at least present the idea or the facade of having a new league was to put a little fear in them by making it appear that if they could attract Branch Rickey, they were serious, and they knew that there was big money available. You know, the rich Texans was part myth and, and part reality. They knew that there was Texas money involved, and, and that was enough to give it a kind of a serious edge. But the real threat was the Continental League had the heartland. They had Houston, they had Minnesota, St. Paul, they had Dallas-Fort Worth. They had some big political figures. The senators from those states were heavy hitters. But Hubert Humphrey was then the senior senator from Minnesota. And they decided to have hearings into baseball's antitrust exemption. All of this really is ancient history for baseball fans today. But the fans of those era didn't know things like free agency and didn't know such things as baseball players being able to play out their option and putting their services up for auction. So every player in football and baseball, when he signed with a team, he signed for life. The baseball teams had that their rights. Joe Garagiola was on The Tonight Show at the end of his career. Joe was in his 30s and made the crossover, one of the first to do it, from being a baseball player to being a baseball analyst or commentator. And Joe said, the, the, explaining to Johnny Carson what the reserve clause was and what free agency would mean. He said, the reserve clause means that if I decide at the age of 55 to come back and play baseball, the Pittsburgh Pirates still have my rights. Joe had been traded from St. Louis to Chicago to Pittsburgh, and after that, several other teams. But in other words, the last team he played for was going to own, own the rights to him for the rest of his life. So the idea of having antitrust hearings in Congress, and they did start after about a week of hearings, Judge Hoffines and Craig Cullinan and George Kirksey 
had a conference call with the commissioner of baseball, Ford Frick, and he said that they were planning on expanding and adding two teams to the National League, and they were thinking of having Houston and New York put a team back in New York to replace the Dodgers and the Giants. And it was because of the hearings and the knowledge that was to a certainty that baseball would lose its antitrust exemption if it didn't give the prospective owners at least throw them some kind of bone that would add expansion teams to the league or accept the third league as a legitimate major league. It would have been a competitive with the American and National League. They didn't want that, but the would-be owners, the aspiring owners in the Continental League, as it was called, were perfectly willing to accept two franchises because they didn't know what the odds were, and realistically, they didn't think they could make a go of it because they had no places to play. Each city was going to have to build a stadium, and it was probably going to have to be built back then with private money. And they all knew that they were talking now about multi-millions. It was one thing to talk about kicking in 25000 as a deposit on a franchise. It was another thing to think about putting 5 or $6 million into a stadium. So they eagerly took the Houston and New York franchises with the understanding that shortly thereafter, there would be additional expansion in the American League. There was the prospects of getting more franchises, and that did away with any plan, real or imagined, to have a Continental League that would be baseball's third major league. What about the first game? What do you remember about that first game? And Colt 45, uh, is it Jefferson Stadium at that time? That was the Oilers, uh, first Oilers game was in Jefferson Jeff, Stadium. That's right. The, the first Major League Baseball game was... I think about April 10th, 1962, in what was called Colt Stadium. Colt Stadium was a little picture postcard gem of a stadium that was built with the cheapest possible material and the lowest possible bids. It cost about $2.5 million, and what I remember mostly about it was it had no overhang. In other words, unlike the Astrodome, it not only didn't have a roof, it had no overhang at all from the seats behind home plate to the outfield. Everything was wide open so that you didn't have night baseball then on Sundays. And the sun would just beat down on people, and you would hear sirens all day long rushing people to the hospital from heat stroke. The thing that was so vivid to me was before the uh, Star Spangled Banner, everybody's hearts were just thumping. Major League Baseball had arrived. And Paul Richards was the general manager of the team when Major League Baseball opened in Houston between the Chicago Cubs and the Houston Cold 45s, as they were then known. Bobby Shantz, who had been the glory tot of the old Philadelphia A's under Connie Mack, had won 27 games for a team that finished 39 games out of first place. Bobby Shantz was the starting pitcher. And Paul Richards was the general manager. He had been the general manager with the Baltimore Orioles and the Chicago White Sox. And each time, Richards had left those jobs to go to another job. And the year or two after he left, those teams went to the World Series. Richards either had a kind of a short attention span or a kind of a small welcome mat. But I remember he was standing directly behind me as we stood up for the Star Spangled Banner. And he said, boys, a few years from now, when they're raising the flag in center field for the National League pennant, and it's the opening game of the World Series, I hope you'll take a moment to, to think a few thoughts about old Richards. I thought that was very touching, and I actually wrote that because Richards realized that he probably wasn't going to be there long enough to see the team get to the World Series. As it turned out, he wasn't the sole proprietor. There were probably 50,000 people who worked for that team who haven't lived to see the team reach the World Series. They reached the World Series, but they haven't won it. I told that story at the baseball meetings that winter, just hanging out one night, batting the breeze with some guys who were from Baltimore and the Chicago papers and had covered Richards when he was the general manager at those two teams. As I said, those teams where Richards had been the general manager, 
went on to go to the World Series. They both said, yeah, Richard said that had the same line for us in Baltimore and in Chicago. So he left that thought, as poignant as it was, wherever he was the general manager. Sure enough, a year or two later, he was fired. At his press conference to announce his signing, somebody asked him how long he thought he'd be with the ball club. And Richard's answer was, up to the day that Judge Rich, Judge Hoffines decides that he knows more baseball than I do. And that is how long he lasted, about four years. Uh, around the same time, the Oilers started up 1960. They win the first two AFL championships, and you got George Blanda and Billy Cannon and, and those teams. What do you remember about meeting Bud Adams and early Bud Adams? Because we, we, we have a definite idea of the later Bud Adams for a lot of us that uh, – uh, saw his last few years in Houston. And what do you remember about Blanda and, and guys like Billy Cannon in those early years? Great question, Robert, because y- y- it'll shock people to know that I-, I actually met Bud before he got involved with the Oilers. He had a semi-pro basketball team that played in the National Industrial Basketball League against teams like the Phillips 66ers out of Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And his father owned the Phillips 66 franchise in Bartlesville back then. And Bud had the Ada Oilers. I guess I'm the last living writer that attended the press conference in Adam's office in the subterranean basement of the Ada office building. There were probably 30, 40 people, writers, radio, TV guys, and a few people from the oil company who squeezed into the building. Bud had a gorgeous office. His conference table was about half the size of a football field. He had a giant aquarium with exotic fish. His desk covered half the room. And it was Bud Adams in his prime and the prime of his youth. He was a flamboyant guy. He was funny and he was colorful. People liked him. This was before the Oilers had some of their heartaches and heartbreaks. And people you know, associated him with hard times and bad times, and he became sort of the local punching bag, the kind of perennial villain in Houston sports. But Adams was pretty shrewd. He was the first guy Lamar Hunt called, and Lamar had tried to buy the Chicago Cardinals football team, as had Adams. So he had gotten from the Chicago people the names of the other potential investors who had tried to buy the Cardinals. So he had the name of a guy at Denver, Bob Housen, who owned the minor league baseball team. He had Ralph Wilson, who wanted a team in Miami, but who ended up with a franchise in Buffalo. And he, of course, knew Bud Adams. They hadn't met personally, but Lamar's father, H.L. Hunt, who was one of the richest men in the world, had done business with Bud's father. Bud met a uh, scout for the Chicago Cardinals named John Breen was very impressed with it. And Breen was a really bright, earthy, fun-loving, articulate, knowledgeable guy who knew everybody and had no BS in him. He, he was a real straight shooter. I mean, it wasn't that he couldn't. He was good at it. But he could tear down a franchise position by position and not miss a beat. Yeah, later one of the first sports talk show uh, hosts in the city of Houston. The, that's right. He had a talk show. But he was the first guy Adams hired. He hired John away from the Chicago Cardinals, made him the general manager of the Houston Oilers. And Breen hired Wally Lim from the Cardinals and Lou Rimkus. Rimkus was the coach and had been with the Baltimore Colts. And he hired Rimkus as the coach and Wally as the assistant to head coach. And they were two great football guys. Wally was a very sharp mind. Lou was a nuts and bolts terrifically disciplined, detailed guy. Lou had a little tendency to talk too much, and he talked himself out of a job. But they came in, and Breen went to work scouting the NFL, and he knew which guys were going to get cut because the teams couldn't hang on to them. Guys like Lenny Dawson, who was the third quarterback in Pittsburgh, but was going to be a Hall of Famer in Kansas City. He knew Blanda was out of football. He was 28 years old, I guess, and had been on the bench for six years in Chicago and played, probably started four games. Of course, he was in Chicago, so he knew all about Blanda, and he signed Blanda. Blanda had played linebacker for Bear Bryant at Kentucky in college, 
So you know that he was a tough nut for a quarterback. In Chicago, he did play some linebacker and very little quarterback. But there's a famous story. George Hallis was the coach for the Bears. Landa was the third-string quarterback and never got to play. And they were having a bad night, and they were trailing like by 40 points in the third quarter, and the crowd started a chant in Soldier Field in Chicago, we want Blanda, we want Blanda. Hallis looked down the bench and cupped his mouth and yelled over to George, Blanda, get over here. And Blanda, suddenly he's going to get into the game, he thinks. He snaps on his helmet, and he runs over to Hallis, and he says to Hallis, yell, coach. And Hallis says, jerks his finger and says, get up there in the stands, they're yelling for you. And that was as close as Blanda got to playing for the Bears. I mean, he actually played in some games, but he never started. So he had a real big chip on his shoulder. He was very quiet when he came to Houston. You didn't know what kind of personality he had, but he had Billy Cannon to hand the ball to and throw the ball to. And he had some great receivers. We didn't know it yet, but Charlie Hennigan, who was going to be a Hall of Famer, a whole bunch of guys who could go catch the ball. And a little running back named Charlie Toller, who had been with the Steelers, one of the San Diego Chargers said it was like trying to tackle a manhole cover. Toller was 5'5 and weighed 210. But Blanda was a really rugged, tough, if he could play for Bear Bryant and even be signed by George Hallis, you know he could play. And he was a no-nonsense guy. He was dead serious about everything. I got to be good friends with Blanda, I thought. In the first two years, they won the championship. The third year, they lost in the championship game to San Diego. The fourth year, they started losing their players. They couldn't keep them there. The San Diego game, we should mention, that was a double overtime game at Jefferson Stadium right here in Houston. Double overtime game. And it was the game where the San Diego captain, their, their running back, said, we'll kick to the wind. So the Oilers got the win and the ball and still lost in double overtime. But anyway, by the fourth season, Blanda was leading the league in interceptions because they had no offensive line at all. In fact, uh, we used to call the offensive line the Civ 7. Blanda threw 48 interceptions that year. He got benched, and they started Jackie Lee. Don Truel was the backup quarterback from Baylor. They played Jackie Lee and Don Truel, and by the sec- start of the second half, they were trailing by 38 to nothing, 42 to nothing in that range. And finally, out of desperation, Ripkes put Blanda back in the game. They had decided they were not going to play him anymore, that it was time to develop their young quarterbacks. The season was over. Blanda went in and threw like five touchdown passes in the second half. He went into the game with this Niagara Falls volume of noise, boos and chants and angry catcalls, and he came off the field to a standing ovation and thunderous applause, and they came back and won the game. So in the locker room after the game, I waited for the crowd to thin out around Blanda. I waited because I'd already written my column, but I wanted to see Blanda because I was the only guy that had actually sort of stuck by him and defended him in print. I thought he'd be glad to see me. So I'm the last guy, and I walk up, and I'm standing there just kind of smiling, just beaming because I'm so happy for the guy. It's a a great, dramatic, you know, rags to riches and rags and back to riches for Blanda's story. He's still tugging on his uniform, changing clothes. And I said, just in a British sense of the phrase, I said, well, old man, And Blanda looked up and said, if you want to talk to me, can that old man bleep? And uh, Blanda was now like 31 or 32, and so uh, he wasn't a kid anymore, but he went on to play until he was 46. In fact, he he was still a kicker for the Raiders when he was 49, when they brought in another kicker. But that was Blanda. He had no sense of humor about the things people found fault with. He went on to the Hall of Fame, and he was a great quarterback, and he had great years, and it took us 10 years after he was gone to fully appreciate how great he was in Houston because they didn't surround him with a lot of talent. Let me ask you about some of the Astros characters. Uh, at the same time in the 60s, they're starting their franchise, and whenever you start a new team, you get guys that might never have had a shot to play in baseball again. Just give me a story or two about a guy from uh, from those early Astros years. I know Doug Rader was a guy that you always hear well, heard stuff about. Yeah, Doug 
Doug was one of those, you know, once in a lifetime players because he was smart. It wasn't funny dumb. He was funny smart. And he could play. He was a terrific third baseman. But the, the, the colorful characters were the ones that came in in the original expansion draft. They had Norm Walker, whose nickname was Dumbo. He had been a regular first baseman of the Dodgers and hit 300 one year. They had Turk Farrell, who had been a prominent pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies and was traded to the Dodgers and had been one of the Dalton gang in the Phillies. They got their nickname because they would break up bars in Philadelphia, and finally they all three got traded. But there was Farrell, there was Joey Amalfitano, the second baseman. They had different categories of players. They had a premium pick with the, the uh, drafting team drafted from an expansion pool. And you got to pick like four players for $250,000 each is what you paid the team you got the player from. And Amalfitano was one of the $250,000 players. That was big money back then. One of the great stories was... Amalfitano, when he came to Houston, we interviewed him and asked him about how he felt when he heard the news. He said, well, the first flood of phone calls I got was from insurance agents. Because when they heard that I went for $250,000, they thought I got that money and they wanted to sell me insurance. And I thought, man, I'm worth a whole lot more than I thought I was. But he got rid of the insurance agents and then was traded to the San Francisco Giants and really had it went on to have a good career. Farrell was one of the great early characters. He threw a spitter to uh, Willie Mays and announced it later in the clubhouse and got fined for admitting that he had thrown a spitball, which was illegal. He threw a pitch to Stan Musial one night. Musial was three for three when he came up for his fourth time at bat. Farrell had written in ink on the ball, drawn a line and said, hit it here, Stan. I wrote a column one time about Farrell, and it was a favorable story, but Farrell came up to me on the plane and said, the boys told me that you ripped me in the paper this morning. I said, no, I didn't, Turk. I said, I, it was a very favorable story. He said, no, that's not what I heard. I heard you ripped me. He said, if you do it again, I'm going to cancel my prescription to the paper. Another great story, they had a colorful catcher named John Bateman, who was a softball player who had no experience playing hardball, but he had a great arm. And they signed him to a contract, and he became their starting catcher, and one year led the team in home runs with 10, his third year in the league. That's how little power that ball club had. But what was great was the first year they signed a rookie named Ernie Fazio to a you know, big bonus contract. I don't know how much, but 75000 you know, in that range, which was, these were guys making 12000 a year, 16000 So they read about a guy making seventy five grand. they are impressed. Well, they brought Fazio up to try to get him acclimated to the big leagues. He could play second base, but he couldn't hit. And he was a little guy. He was Nellie Fox's size, 5'6", about 165 pounds. Maybe heavier. He was chunky. But Fazio looked great, and he had a terrific swing. He just couldn't make contact. So he struck out three or four times one game, and after about the second or third strikeout, he came back to the bench, and Batum, Bateman called him aside and said, Ernie, let me look at your bat. Fazio handed him his bat, and Bateman said, here's your problem. He said, you're using a 35-ounce bat. It's way too heavy for you. He said, use this one. He said, it's a Bobby Shantz model. It's 32 ounces. He said, you'll do much better with this bat. And Fazio said, you think I'll be able to get some hits with this bat? And Bateman said, no, but it'd be a lot lighter carrying it back to the dugout. <laughs> they had good times. They, they were not lovable like the Mets. But the, when they lost, they lost with regret. They played hard, and they had some guys who went on to become you know, good, solid major league players. Bob Aspermonte, for example. Jerry Grody was, became an all-star catcher with the Mets. Of course, they very quickly brought up Joe Morgan and Jimmy Wynn. I once figured it out they had seven players who made it to the World Series with other teams. If they kept those guys, Rusty Staub, who was their first great bonus player, they brought him up at 18 to bat cleanup and play first base. But if they kept Staub and Wynn and Morgan some of their pitchers together, they would have had a World Series team in the first 10 years. It wouldn't have taken 30 years. 
How many home runs do you think Jimmy Wynn would have hit if he would have not been playing in the Astrodome? I think his best year was 35 or 38 home runs in the Astrodome. How many was he losing, do you think, per, per year? Oh, he had guys backed up to the wall once or twice a game practically. I think he would have hit 40, 45 home runs every year, and he would have had a Hall of Fame career because there wasn't anybody pound for pound that had the power that Wynn had. You know, he, he went to the Dodgers and led them in home runs. By then, he was in his 30s. They tried to make him a shortstop, and he, he wasn't a shortstop, but he became terrific as a center fielder. He was one of the best in the league. He had terrific speed. He was a, an all-star player, one of the players in the franchise history that on any other team would have been a, a household name. The Astros right now have some guys that are great multi-tool players that we're seeing that come up, and it seems like it's been a long time since you've seen Astro players with, with this many different skills outside of maybe Carlos Beltran for that brief time that he was in Houston in 2004. Cesar Cedeno, though, was a guy that was – an amazing talent. How good of a ball player was he? How talented was he compared to the guys that, that you remember from that generation? When I hear people talk about Carlos Correa, I immediately thought about Cedeno. They were very similar. I'm not sure I can say that Correa has more potential than Cedeno had. When Leo DeRocha said that Cedeno was another Willie Mays, he wasn't exaggerating. There was you know, tragedy in Cedeno's career. He never reached his potential. But when it came to swinging the bat, hitting for average, hitting for power, running, throwing, catching the ball, Cedeno was in a class with Clemente and Mays. There wasn't a better prospect in the however many years Willie Mays played. I think it was 18. There wasn't a better prospect than Cesar Cedeno. This team, this Astros team, has championship caliber players. This team should be a World Series team in the next three years. The Astros should have been a World Series team when they had Cedeno and they had Bob Watson and they had the great pitching staff, Joe Necro, Dave Smith, Pierre Richard, and Nolan Ryan. Posing teams' batting averages would drop 20 points weeks after they came to Houston and had to face Ryan and Richard on back-to-back -back nights. That's how tough those guys were. You wrote biographies on Ryan, and you wrote a biography with Mickey Mantle. First, I want to ask you about the Mickey Mantle thing, because I remember at the end of his life, he had all these regrets, and it became a different guy, and he realized what all had happened. I'm, I'm trying to remember when you wrote your biography on Mantle. Was, was this before that, and what kind of a guy was Mantle then? What do you remember about him as far as just his personal outlook on life? And, the, of course, the alcoholism I'm talking about. I ended up doing four books with Mickey or with his family. So I, I feel like, honestly, without exaggerating it or exploiting it, that I probably came to know Mickey as well as anybody did late in his life. The books I wrote with Mickey spanned the years 93 to 95, and he died in 95. I was working on a book with Mantle and his sons and wife when he died. I can tell you it was an extraordinary experience. He was one of the sweetest guys I've ever known. It turned out we had just finished the first autobiography, and it was hard to say you were doing an autobiography of Mickey Mantle, except that Mantle never gave you everything he had. So there were probably four Mickey Mantle autobiographies. I found a little different hook to hang the book on by writing about his World Series experiences. And the book was called All My Octobers. It gave me a chance to write about the stars of the National League that he played against in October. And then we also wove into the, the things I found out about his childhood growing up, off the field issues and things, as part of the narrative of that time of his career, because those were the glory years. It was late in the process. We were actually ready to send the ship the manuscript to the printers when Mickey told me about how serious the alcoholism was and that he was going into rehab. That was a shock. I mean, we all knew Mantle drank a lot. But back then, you thought of it more as beer and an occasional scotch. You didn't think of it as that he was a full-blown alcoholic. Yeah, and at the time, the, the, the word disease and alcoholism, it, it hadn't, you know, this wasn't something that people equated, and that sort of changed history over the last uh, 
you know, 20 to 30 years where we start thinking of alcoholism in terms of an actual disease and, and, and not something that uh, is just a, a, a habit that's a little out of control. Exactly. Uh, we thought of it really more as a party animal thing and a locker room ritual. Guys would hang around the locker room and knock off a six-pack each after the ball game, and then go out and have dinner and start drinking. I remember when Mickey came back from Betty Ford, the, the clinic, after being in rehab. We were launching the book in New York at a Walden's bookstore in the Wall Street district and at Mickey Mantle's restaurant. I wasn't scheduled to go to New York for the launch of the book because how much help was, was Mickey Mantle really need in New York? I called him the day before he was leaving to wish him a good trip and good luck and give him a little encouragement. I'll never forget he said to me in the softest kind of pained expression, he said, Mickey, I'm dreading it. He said, I, I just hate the idea of doing this. I said, hate what? He said, going to New York and having to plug this book. I said, why? I said, you know, the book's going to do great. He said, yeah, but nobody's going to ask me about it. All they're going to ask me about is my drinking and about Betty Ford and what was rehab like. And then it dawned on me. He had never talked about it. He wasn't eager to face those demons. So I said, just on impulse, I said, Mickey, uh, would you like me to come along and run a little interference for you? And if writers start belaboring that subject, try to move it away and back to baseball and back to the book. There was a little pause and he said, would you do that? I said, well, sure. I said, who wouldn't want to go to New York with Mickey Mantle? So I did, and that's how we got through it. This was 95. The irony is the day after we had the initial press conference and the initial sales of the book was the day of the O.J. Simpson white Bronco chase, Bronco the white Bronco chase. chase, yeah. I was going to stay over to cover the Rockets and the Knicks. The paper took me off of that and told me to stay in my hotel room, watch television, and write a column about O.J. Simpson. That night, Mickey called me and asked me to have dinner with him. Two nights in a row, I had to write a column, and I had to say no. And I'll bet you I'm the only writer in the country, including all the guys that covered him in New York, who turned down two chances to have dinner alone with Mickey Mantle. Double shot of Mickey with you, Mickey and Mickey. Me, I have one great story I have to tell you. That. One of my favorite stories about any competitive sports guy, but to tell you a little bit about what made Mickey Mantle great. We had the opening signing at Walden's in the Wall Street area. When we got there, they had mounted police patrolling a four-block area that had been roped off for the crowds that were waiting to get a book signed by Mickey Mantle. The block that the Waldens was on, the line went around the block twice. Mantle had agreed to do an hour and a half, and it wasn't because he was a prima donna. He was scheduled to have two knee replacements. Both his knees were shot. And the reason he went into rehab, Robert, was, I don't know if anybody ever knew this, but the doctors looked at him and they couldn't operate on him. His liver was so bad. His white cell count was so high. They had to get his body free of the toxins before they could even think about operating on his knees. So that's really why he went to rehab. When Mickey Finney signing, the manager came over to thank him for his effort. She asked him if he'd do another 30 minutes. There were still 200 people in the street waiting to get their book signed. And Mantle exploded. He uttered every hyphenated curse word I'd ever heard. But he was in such pain he couldn't help it. He resented the fact that he had voluntarily given them another half hour. And now they were asking for more. And she apologized profusely and begged him to forgive them and thanked him for his effort and said, I just want you to know we appreciate what you did. This was the second biggest day in the history of this store. And suddenly Mickey's mood changed and he said, the second biggest day? He said, what was the biggest day? She said, it was by Howard Stern. And Mantle said, how many books did he sign? And she said, 859. And Mantle said, well, how many have we signed? She said, 835. And he sat down and he said, send in the next 100 and tell the police to send the rest home. It was important to him 
just to break the book signing record of Howard Stern. That's what a competitor he was. You also did a book with Nolan Ryan. And what was the most surprising thing that you learned from that book with Nolan Ryan, just learning about Nolan and his personality? I think the fact that Nolan really has a great sense of humor and how funny he was. People didn't realize he was thoughtful and bright. And of course, he ended up running the Rangers and doing a great job of it. But he was quiet and he was shy for most of his career. And he sort of bloomed and blossomed by the time he got to Arlington. But I remember late in his career there, his wife, Ruth, who's just a lovely, beautiful person, decided she wanted to go to the Nolan Ryan fantasy camp, but not as a spectator. She wanted to play. And Nolan tried to talk her out of it. And she was just insistent. She wanted to be involved in one of that experience. So he let her sign up as a camper. They went to their training camp. Ruth put on the uniform, got a bat and glove, and she actually batted against her husband. She got in the batter's box, and she told me that she actually made contact. She grounded out kind of a weak ground ball to the shortstop and thrown out at first base. She was really proud of that. But she said what was funny was that the first pitch Nolan threw to her, She had to hit the deck, actually had to fall to the ground. It was inside pitch, and she sprained her left wrist. And I said, you're kidding me. He actually threw an inside fastball to you the first time you stood in the batter's box? And she said, yes, he did. I said, put him on the phone. So we got on the phone. I said, Nolan, I can't believe it. Did you actually knock down your own wife? And he said, Mickey, I had to. She was digging in on me. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds like a Bob Gibson story. Yeah. Well, let's go to basketball a little bit. And you were one of the original owners of the Houston Rockets. You helped bring the team to Houston. It's an amazing story. And I think about that as a reporter, a former reporter and a reporter now. I was like, well, how do you do that when you're also a reporter Is it a conflict of interest? What happened there? Why did you end up doing that? Well, it would have been a conflict of interest, but I didn't have any idea, any clue that we could actually obtain a team. And it started out, Wayne Duddleston, who was a real estate developer in Houston and a good friend of mine, wanted to get a franchise in the NFL in Phoenix. And at that time, they didn't have football in Arizona. And so I took Wayne to New York to meet with the NFL commissioner, Pete Rozelle. And I had been director of communications for the AFL at the time of the merger. Pete told us flatly that there would be no expansion in the NFL for the next 10 years. And when it came, the the money would start at about $10 million, which at the time seemed like a hugely overpaying price. So I had a thought as we were leaving the building. I Right across the street from the NFL offices were the NBA offices. I said, why don't we go talk to Walter Kennedy, the commissioner of the NBA, and see if there's an NBA team available. I said, you can get one for a lot less money. And I said, the NBA is going to be big by the end of the 70s and early 80s. At least I really believed that. And, of course, I think it turned out to be true, except the 90s were when it really exploded. But we went and we saw Walter Kennedy, and there were three franchises for sale. The Milwaukee Bucks, who then had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the San Diego Rockets, and the Cincinnati Royals, who were coached by Bob Cousy. But San Diego appealed to us because their star player was Alvin Hayes. And, of course, they were already called the Rockets, and Houston was already the home of the Rocket Space Program. And you had a little bitty Calvin Murphy that had just got drafted by them. And, and, and we, we, we didn't know that, didn't know that Calvin, one yet. But we had Calvin Murphy, Rudy T, and Mike Doolin. It really was a terrific roster. So we called, we talked. Bob Breitbart, who is the owner, said he was interested. He talked to us. He said, but he said there wasn't going to be any, any negotiation. So I went out there and I took a cashier's check for $100,000. The asking price was $5.6 million. I gave him the $100,000 good faith deposit so we could look at the books. In three weeks, we made a deal. We had to make a deal because it was July. Teams were going to camp in August, and it was insane. We, we should have kept the team in San Diego. But Breitbart had a problem with the city and the rental on the arena, and he was losing his tail, and he couldn't afford it. So he was either going to sell the team or shut it down. So we had to move quickly. When I knew we were going to buy the team, I wrote a letter to Bill Hobby, resigning from the paper as sports editor, left that on his desk. I called when we made the deal and gave the story to the sports department. At the same time, told him to tell Bill to open my letter. So that's how I avoided the conflict of interest. Although there had been a little one up to that point, I cut it off after I knew we were going to be involved with the team. 
because you're right. I, I couldn't be an owner or a partner in the basketball team and still cover sports for the Post. And in fact, when we sold the basketball team, I put in a self-imposed three-year period where I didn't cover the Rockets at all or write about them. Even later, it was hard for me to write about the team because I knew I had that connection that I'd always have. But it, it was a heck of an experience. We, as you mentioned, we had Elvin and Calvin Murphy and Mike Newland, Rudy Tomjanovich, Stu Lance. Some real fine talent if we had just kept that team together. You talk about Elvin Hayes. I want to take you back to 1968, the game of the century, UCLA versus U of H. You had Guy V. Lewis against John Wood and Elvin Hayes versus Lou Alcindor. An incredible world event, really, at that time. The beginning of college basketball as a big deal. What do you remember about that scene in the Astrodome in 1968? Of course, it was the biggest crowd in the history of basketball. And I'm not sure if the Harlem Globetrotters ever drew more, but they would have been the only basketball team. And I don't know that we could consider them legitimately a basketball team, but no college, no pro team, under no circumstances, had ever drawn 65, 66, 67,000 people. So the Astrodome was packed. Before the game, I went to the top row of the upper deck just to get a sense of the perspective of what it was like. And you couldn't see the basketball. It looked like a golf ball from up there. So the people who sat in those upper reaches had to use opera glasses or binoculars. And sitting courtside at at the press table, the basketball thumping was so loud, your eardrums got echoes. Al Cinder was not yet Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He had a scratch on his eyeball and was wearing goggles. So that was sort of unreal seeing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was then Lou Al Cinder, in goggles looking like somebody from outer space. And Elwin was so hyped for that game that he sank the two free throws that iced the ball game. The Cougars won it. And when they UCLA missed the last shot. Elvin dribbled out the clock the last 14, 20 seconds just as a kind of a blowback on all the talk about how skilled Al Cinder was. He could even handle the ball. Elvin was determined to dribble the ball to show that he could handle the ball as well. Yeah, and I remember that great scene where he throws the ball up towards the ceiling as the time's running out. And Guy V. Lewis becomes a legend and really he just passed away a few months ago. And I just wanted to get you a couple thoughts from you on Guy V because it seems like the Cougars really didn't have a program before Guy V as far as basketball. There really hasn't been much since then. Hopefully that's changing as we speak. But what about Guy V Lewis? What made him such a special guy? Well, first of all, he came from a little town called Ark, Texas. And when he enrolled at the University of Houston, they were just starting their basketball program. I think he played on the first basketball team that the University of Houston had. He told me the first time they they worked out, they played with a basketball that was peeling. The, The actual leather cover was coming off of it. Guy could have been a Hall of Fame college player on that record alone. It was a six foot four inch center for the Cougars, and he routinely would score 40 or more points. I know he had at least a high of 49, maybe more than that. He may have had a 57 point game. Uh, he was a great shooter. He was a terrific rebounder. He carried that over. He went from being a player to an assistant coach. I can't now remember who the head coach was, but he succeeded him and then became the only coach they had or the second coach they had for the next 30 years. What people never understood was what a terrific motivator guy was. He handled every player differently. He knew exactly what kind of motivation they needed, whether they needed a pep talk or a tough love or whether they needed a kick in the bottom. Guy handled everybody differently. He was a terrific X's and O's coach, even though he never got credit for that. But I remember one time he fired up his team so much that they rushed off to the go to the court for the second half after his halftime speech, and they locked him in the dressing room. And it wasn't until the second half was ready to start that they realized they didn't have their coach with them, so they had to go back and let him out of the locker room. But I knew basketball. One of the amazing things to me was how people talked about how little coaching he did. He'd roll the ball out and let the players play. And the NBA coaches that had Elvin, for example, always talked about how he had to be handled and how difficult he was. And you never heard him being difficult with Guy V. Lewis. Guy always got the best out of him and all of his players. He was a terrific tactician. 
And, of course, everybody remembers how well he developed Akeem Olajuwon from basically a soccer player who didn't know much coming in from Nigeria. And when he came into the league, he was also known as a little bit of difficult to deal with. But Guy V, just a, an incredible job of developing all those guys. So Guy V and that game happens in 1968 where we talked about the Rockets coming to Houston. And right in the middle of all that, great story. You go to the 1972 Munich Olympics. You meet Howard Cosell. I think you guys ended up doing a a book together with Howard, doing a biography for Howard. I want to ask you about Howard Cosell because obviously this guy is, he is the legend of all legends in broadcasting and there's got to be a million stories. But also I want to ask you about those Munich games because that really was the beginning of the terrorism that we see today. It kind of set the tone for what would happen and it really was a landmark thing, really, in, in the history of the world. I actually went to the games as a fluke, not to cover them for the Houston Post, but to write television copy for Chris Schenko, who was then the anchor before Jim McKay, or the studio host. Almost the last minute, they called and asked me if I'd do that, because they knew Chris needed a little help with some of the color and commentary and the voiceover on the uh, features they did, that he needs somebody to write copy for it. So I, I, they hired me to do that, and that's what I did. I basically stayed in the studio and wrote transition and voiceover narratives for Chris to do for the pieces that the reporters brought in. The day that the, actually the early morning that the terrorists made their attack on the Israeli dormitory barracks, I was in the ABC headquarters building, which was not more than 100 feet from where the Israeli quarters were. We left at 4.30, and the attack came at about 5.10. If the van that picked us up had been about 40 minutes later to take us back to the press dormitory, I would have heard the gunshots. As it was, got to bed about 5, 5.30, and there was a knock at my door about 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm totally groggy and three-quarters unconscious. I go to the door, and there's a security guard. One of the interesting things, Robert, was the German government to try to detach itself as much as possible from the memory of Germany in World War II had totally unarmed security. The guards, the police, no military, they wore no weapons. They had on pastel blue slacks and white shirts. They looked like tour guides. So one of the security guards came to my door, knocked on the door, and asked for my credentials. I could hear sirens wailing in the distance in that ooh-ah, ooh-ah, European way, and I went and got my press badge without even thinking about it, and I handed it to the guy, I said, is there something wrong? And he said, there's a problem in the village. And that was all he said to me was, there's a problem in the village. So I tried to go back to sleep, couldn't sleep, turned on the radio, and heard them talking about the hostages being taken, and one Israeli dead, and 11 Israeli athletes known to be hostages. Did you feel, I remember, I think it was Jim McKay said, you know, all of a sudden he realized he was probably in the biggest story in his career, and you're a sports guy, and all of a sudden this is going on. Did you feel that as well? It didn't dawn on me as it would with Jim, because the television was already in the middle of minute-by-minute on-the-air coverage. But it did sink in very quickly, because when I listened to the radio and heard what happened, I put my sweatsuit back on and tried to go back to the ABC building, and I couldn't get in because I didn't have a badge. I was standing at the gate outside the Olympic Village, and there was Cosell. So Cosell grabbed me, and we actually went around the security and up a hill. Actually, that's where we were, laying on our bellies on the grassy hill overlooking the village and overlooking the Israeli barracks where you saw the PLO commando, whatever he was, parading back and forth on the patio while the hostages were bound and gagged inside. We could see that movement from the hill. And then later we were able to sneak in with the boxing team. They gave us jackets and we just walked in with them. So we did get into the village and we did get to the ABC building and we got new badges and we were able to walk around. But it was so depressing and so frightening that nothing like it had ever happened. These were games. These were young people. And there had never been any hint of menacing developments, any hostility. There had been injuries and there had been political overtones, but there had been 
violence. Death and violence had never visited the Olympic Games, and now they were right there unfolding in front of our eyes. Every bit of it was seared on your mind and your memory from then on. What do you remember about Cosell and meeting him and getting to know him over the years? I had known Howard actually from baseball for almost 10 years. We had not met each other on a regular basis, but Howard was a close friend of Bobby Bragan, who had been a coach with the Houston Astros, and Bobby liked him, and so I didn't know any better. I wasn't from New York, and I didn't know how despised Howard was in New York. Bobby liked him, and, and I had, on Bragan's goodwill, took on Howard in good faith as a good guy. We had something of a friendship, and when I had written about him, I had written favorably, and I remember he uh, did a play-by-play, blow-by-blow boxing match, Jimmy Ellis and Ingemar Johansson from Stockholm, Sweden. I wrote a column about it. The column was, Howard didn't have a second announcer. He did the whole match himself. The theme of the column was, I heard something on television I'd never heard before, and after struggling and straining, I finally identified it as a quality called truth. And here was Cosell televising this very dull boxing match, urging the viewers to switch to another channel because the match was so bad. So that's what I wrote. Howard liked that column so much that when it came time to do his autobiography, he asked me to do it based on that column. He could be charming at times, but he could also be extremely difficult. You talk, talked about Mickey Mantle and, and the way he was, but Howard was even more so, it sounds like. He had a way of uh, charming you one second, and the next second he would get on your last nerve. Howard's greatest critic was a writer in New York called Dick Young, named Dick Young. Howard wanted me to write a column in the Houston Post about what an unfair and what a low-life, corrupt columnist Dick Young was. I tried to avoid getting into the subject in any depth, but Howard wouldn't leave me alone about it. Finally, I had to tell him, I said, Howard, there's no reason for me to write a column about Dick Young in Houston. I said, my readers don't know who he is. They don't see the the New York papers. They wouldn't know who anything about him. They wouldn't know why I'm writing this. And Howard took a scar out of his mouth and he said, Mickey, you sports writers stick together like germs. <laughs> he said, the trouble with you is you want to get along with everybody. And this is not a get-along-with-everybody world. And I always remember that, and I thought, he's absolutely right. And if I have to start not getting along with somebody, Howard will be my first choice. <laughs> well, before I wrap it up, I know you're, you're working on a book. Can you tell me anything about the book yet? I'd like to wait. We'll talk about that another time. Yeah, well, let's talk about that another time. That sounds good. Can I give you one final anecdote? Yeah, one, one final anecdote, sure. It'll be about the guy that was the most impressive athlete of my life. I've been fortunate to be around Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams and Mickey Mantle and Stan Musial, Akeem Olajuwon, Nolan Ryan, Earl Campbell, all the great athletes of Houston from the 60s on. But the athlete that made the biggest impression on me, who was the biggest figure of my sports career, was Muhammad Ali. I happened to be with Muhammad Ali in Chicago when he was fighting the draft board about his status during the Vietnam War. And he was flying to Houston because he had had his draft case transferred from Louisville, Kentucky to Houston, thinking he would get a better deal from the people in Houston, which wasn't really quite the case. But anyway, we were in Chicago, and Ali was being Ali, and we were on the plane, and we're sitting in our seats, and we're telling stories, or Ali's telling stories, and I'm sitting there laughing. And the airline hostess walks up the aisle over her shoulder without looking at us. She says, we're about to take off. Please fasten your seatbelts. And Ali yelled after her, Superman don't need no (laughs) seatbelt. And the airline hostess turned her head ever so slightly just to see him out of the corner of her eye. And I have no idea if she knew who he was. But her answer was, Superman don't need no airplane. (laughs) Well, that's a hell of an anecdote. It's a great way to end it. It just seems like there's so much stuff to talk about. And I just, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time. You wrote biographies. We mentioned Nolan Ryan and Mickey Mantle, Howard Cosell, but there was George Allen, Tom Kite. You did non-sports biographies, Betty Davis, Shirley Jones, Dan Rather, Gene Autry, John Conley, George W. Bush's 
father, is that right, as yes. well? Uh, actually, his grandfather, his, H, uh, Prescott Bush. Yeah, George H.W. Bush's father. father right. right, right. So much stuff, but it's great to have somebody that's the Houston sports historian and can relay all these stories and remind us about this history, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you for remembering all that, and thank you for all those kind words, Robert. I enjoyed every bit of it. Mickey Herskowitz, everybody. Thank you.